I'm ready. I have rejoined. Said, can you hear me? Hi, Ahmed. Hi, everyone. Dr. Susan, Dr. Ehab. Um, welcome everyone to uh, our event, uh, one of the ICC uh, Young Computer Forum events. Um, um, our event today under the um, title of the current development of arbitration in Qatar. Uh, we have a respectable panel, we'll start in um, a few minutes to uh, uh, making their presentations. Before we start the presentations, I would like to make some kind of um, housekeeping. Um, Please uh, be sure that this one is recorded and uh, we will be sharing the recording later to all the attendees. Uh, we're not gonna provide any certificates if somebody is asking about that one. Um, on the other hand, uh, we will having a different uh, presentations. Uh, each speaker will have his own uh, uh, time. And at the end of the presentation, at the end of the session, we will be allowing the floor to ask questions. Can you use the questions and the answer? Um, type your question to which speaker, and we will be asking the question um, at the end. Um, at the beginning, let me share with you my screen. At the beginning, I would like to um, introduce you to the ICCF. Uh, before we move into the ICCF, which is the International Chamber of Commerce, uh, we would like to thank um, uh, the Charter Institute of Arbitrators today, who is our partner and the sponsor for this event, um, Charter Institute of Arbitrators uh, Qatar branch, which established a few years ago, and we have the pleasant of having the president of the branch to speaking to us today. Um, I'm one of the board members in this uh, branch, which is actually a very active branch in Qatar. And it's very active um, in, in promoting for the ADRs uh, um, in Qatar and, of course, worldwide. Um, and also, we'd like to thank our partner, uh, which is the Qatar International uh, Court for Dispute uh, and Dispute the Center. So my name is Saad Hagazi. I'm the ICCF uh, MENA and Turkey representative and also board member of the Qatar International uh, uh, CIR uh, branch. I'm head of the dispute uh, resolution at the SCM consultancy, and I'm working as a dispute uh, consultant and expert witness, and uh, I have a practice of the arbitration. So what is the ICCF? ICCF is an interactive forum under the aegis of the International Chamber of Commerce for young arbitrators and practitioners uh, approximately 40 years uh, and under, which is an international very fast growing network. The IAF uh, has a major objectives, which is basically strengthening the ties among the young uh, members of the international reputation community and provide an opportunities to meet and discuss the current issues uh, facing the international reputation practices. And also to build a reach an international network via the organization of educational and social events. Uh, IAF has been presented in the region for a while, and uh, in MENA region, we had a lot of uh, events, and um, uh, of course, before the COVID, we had the physical, the presence of having a physical event. Our target is to bring the, uh, the uh, most world known uh, speakers to the young practitioner to get um, the best knowledge out of it. So uh, we have the Global Coordination Committee, which is uh, Anna Sarah Mori, uh, Alina, and Stephen, in Africa, uh, uh, the uh, ICC, uh, head by Sami Hray, the ICC uh, MENA region um, director, um, and his deputy, Dania Fahis, and myself in Qatar. So please, if you are not joining, if you have not joined before to ICCF, please join and keep yourself uh, updated to, you can follow all our events and the activities. So this is our website. And you can also log into the ICC uh, website um, for following the news. Before we start, I would like to also give you, uh, sharing you with you an update on ICC. Um, ICC, which is the International Chamber of Commerce, has recently selected for the first time uh, a president to the uh, International Court. 
okay, uh, a, a, a female president for the international court. Uh, the uh, the the court election was just recently, uh, I think, 15 days ago. Um, the new mandate has been announced, and we also had the pleasure uh, the pleasure of having one of the international court members uh, in Qatar, Mr. Sultan Al Abdullah. Uh, he was replacing one of the uh, most in distinguished uh, guys before uh, uh, His Excellency Dr. Uh, Sheikh Thani, who was actually uh, the uh, previous representative of Qatar of ICC court. I would like to congratulate uh, uh, Mr. Sultan Al Abdullah and thanks Dr. Uh, uh, Thani for his service for the ICC. And I will start with the first speaker. Our first speaker today is uh, Engineer Ahmed Ansari. He is the president of the Charter Institute of Arbitrator Qatar branch and also the technical office manager in Ajgal. Uh, Ahmad started in 1984 at Qatar uh, Fertilizer Company uh, for almost 13 years as a mechanical uh, technician to a mechanical project engineer. In 1997 was joined um, um, the water project department at Ministry of Electricity and Water, which he became the head of department in 1999. In 2001, Ahmed moved to Qatar National Olympic Committee as the program leader responsible for planning and delivery of some of um, uh, 32 prestigious sport facilities and projects for Doha 2006 Asian Games. In 2006, uh, he was the managing director of uh, Lagoon Qatar, providing multi-disciplinary engineering and uh, construction services. In 2013, he joined Public Works uh, Authority and, and now uh, he is in the charge of the president technical office. Ahmed has a university degree in the mechanical engineering, a master degree in project management and construction, and master uh, of laws in construction law and arbitration. And he is a charter, uh, he is a charter construction manager as well, uh, follow and a charter member of various international professional institute. Uh, Ahmed, uh, I will leave the floor for you. I will leave you guys with Ahmed so you can enjoy uh, his presentation. Ahmed, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Saad. Thank you all for uh, attending this uh, important webinar this evening. And uh, I hope you're going to like my presentation this evening. I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, towards the end of this uh, uh, session. Let me... Can everybody see the uh, presentation slides? Yes, Ahmed, we can see it. Can you play it? Can you press play? Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to uh, full screen. Okay. Now, as much as I'm interested in uh, you know use of technology in our construction contract, I am also a fan of teamwork in uh, construction projects. And for this particular reason, I'm doing my best to promote the use of integrated project delivery kind of contracts into our construction projects within the Public Works uh, Authority. As you may know, the uh, inspiration of teamwork within construction contracts will bring a great and big value to the completion of any construction project. So it is basic, basically a model which has been uh, developed by the lean institutions and very much motivating all parties to any construction contract to work collab collaboratively together to achieve a common goal that everyone is aiming for. That's the a successful completion of a construction project on time and to budget and also to uh, expected equality. Now, uh, this is the uh, definition of the collaborative partnering and basically focusing, enhancing and fostering a team environment uh, where challenges are addressed and tackled collectively and disputes are resolved early, hence yielding a positive impact on uh, project uh, uh, elements. And uh, with achieving collaborative partnering with an construction contract, that's going to be basis for uh, enhanced better communications, problem solving, and decision uh, making. Now, there are great needs for uh, you know, uh, having collaborative relationship with construction contracts. When we have some high uncertainties, for instance, in any kind of construction contracts and without lots of ambiguities. So working closely together as a team or collectively, we can always look into the uncertainties and the common understanding to you know clarify and overcome those uncertainties and similarly to any ambiguities. 
And that's going to be a good sign of trust and transparency amongst the parties to any uh, uh, contract. And with achieving that, obviously, we can always go for better planning and design management and thereafter better construction management. And needless to say, by having that collaborative relationship, we can always have a better contact administration with most of the contractual problems can always work at and resolve in, uh, uh, as early as possible. Now, a general statement I made here with great collaboration, uh, you know, uh, uh, within any construction contract, uh, as I said earlier, this is very much enhanced by the latest updated improvement within the flow of information, technology, and communications, which are currently using uh, very much in our construction contracts. This is a statement I made a few years ago in one of the uh, forums, in which I have clearly stated that you know failure to work as a team often leads to failure. And it's very important to achieve that you know within construction contract when we have a, a you know the spirit of uh, teamwork, but with the, you know always embrace uh, you know a trust and mutual expectations of our shared project outcomes. Now, what is the concept of this talk? As I said, you know, um, we are looking into how the information management technology can support building evidence and integrated project delivery contracts. Now, it is not only integrated project delivery uh, contracts which I'm referring to this evening. It can be any contract, okay? So the latest development within the information management technology made available to the construction industry have this definitely helped in better management of construction contracts where information are collected and gathered on real time uh, captured and very smoothly and easily recorded and reported you know, instantly through live dashboards. So when those uh, data are captured on real, real time basis, you know, uh, an immediate intervention can be made follow, uh, following a, a, a thorough assessment and analysis and analysis of those captured uh, uh, data where any abnormalities can be identified. So thereafter, some uh, measures and actions, rectification actions can be taken to you know, overcome any abnormalities or any areas of, uh, of concerns. Now, what are the available uh, information management technologies within the market? Now, these are some examples. I'm not going to cover everything in tonight's talk, but it's very important for any construction agency, whether it's contractor or client, to have a proper repository and data warehousing. Okay, so after those data warehousing, uh, always references can be made to some past data, you know, historical data and lessons learned where decisions can be made for any future projects. Learning from past mistakes, for instance, and learning from any disputes, uh, how they were being uh, managed and uh, uh, resolved. So those things can be always considered into new contracts. So whenever a new contract is drafted based on lessons learned in the past, those mistakes, you know, those ambiguities, whatever experience in the past can be easily overcome in future jobs. Now, building information management, BIM is a very important management tool. It's uh, not a software as such, but it's a management system that covers the entire project life cycle. And this is what I'm gonna cover in the next slide. Now, similarly with artificial intelligence, and virtual reality so with artificial intelligence, any design can be simulated, all right, can be seen before it is getting built. And similarly, with virtual reality, when a model is fully developed for any kind of building and a walkthrough can be made, uh, you know, uh, uh, clashes can, of services of, of, of whatever game work can be detected as early as possible. So thereafter, can be easily overcome afterwards at, at construction uh, stage. Now, blockchain is a technology that's you know, recently been introduced into the market that basically focuses on the block of activities covering the entire activities related to delivery of any projects, right all the way from the outset until the uh, handover. 
Now, this is a very uh, complex kind of uh, technology that requires a great deal of time to explain. So I'm not going to cover it, but this is definitely the future. And we are looking into it very seriously to consider it, you know, as a tool that we can use within our operations within the public works authority. Now, use of the drones is a high technology as well, uh, very widely used. I'm going to talk about it in a nutshell in my next slide as well. Similarly, we are currently using some mobile applications to trace and track the progress and performance of our consumption contracts. Now, we have introduced BIM to our operations about two years ago, and I'd be glad to say that the preparation uh, work has already been implemented and done, where we have clear policies, processes, and procedures on how to uh, use BIM into our operations. And now we just started the full implementation of BIM about uh, a couple of months ago, and it's ongoing uh, uh, very well. Now, you know, some people think BIM is a software. It is not a software. It's, a, as I said, information management tool uh, that uh, consists and contains many other softwares used in uh, design, for instance, and uh, progress uh, uh, and reporting and planning uh, in, in uh, you know, uh, quantity surveying, for instance, and the like. And also there are some other tools used uh, to uh, uh, support uh, facility management afterwards. Now, out of them, there's a great uh, level of information always been recorded. And those informations for any reason of disputes may uh, uh, arise at any stage of uh, project development, for instance, those information can always be referred to as evidence. Whenever there is a dispute, for instance, or any uh, uh, misinterpretation of some work being done in the past, and there's some argument over it. So with the uh, you know, data storage in which all information being stored in, can, can always refer to those uh, information and use them as evidence to support, uh, 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 you know, accepting or declining any uh, uh, disputes. Now, these are some of the benefits uh, of, uh, uh, of BIM in uh, building evidence. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, it's, uh, the BIM contains lots of activities at the pre stage. Uh, uh, and also at pay, a post stage of any construction uh, contracts. So an early, uh, at early stages, for instance, of planning and design uh, where, uh, uh, you know, uh, parties are uh, working together collaboratively and a great deal of combinations are uh, maintained on the planning and design works where also uh, simulations are made and those simulations and uh, 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 you know uh, the uh, modeling of any design work help very much in identification of any uh, off-site operations that uh, minimize the reliance on site uh, construction. So uh, nowadays there are many of our activities uh, and uh, building materials are uh, pre or fabricated uh, off-site and brought to site for installations. Now by doing this. Uh, uh, we uh, managed to reduce the number of resources uh, on site, also minimized uh, uh, many of the uh, site operations, uh, and which led to better health and safety uh, practices uh, on site. Now, uh, with BIM as well, there are great chances that uh, changes can be uh, controlled. Uh, I wouldn't say to total elimination, although it says there are no change orders, but uh, you know, both based on the culture we've got right here in the concession of the city and other, uh, I can say with a great confidence, this is against our culture. So changes are always uh, expected due to human interventions, not uh, due to other uh, necessities uh, or requirements, uh, but primarily due to, uh, you know, individual and human desires, changes are very much likely to happen. But nonetheless, we can always to try uh, you know, to do our best to control changes uh, uh, on site. So there are uh, no data loss into the system. As I said, data gathered and collected and stored uh, 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 you know, at great uh, uh, efficiency. 
and data can always be referred to as evidences to resolve any disputes that may uh, merge at any time of the uh, life cycle of project delivery. Now, the use of drones became very important in our uh, construction uh, uh, industry. And the drones are uh, so called as well unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, uh, you know, capture images uh, that helps at both stages, at planning and design stage. And thereafter, also uh, support the uh, contract management of, uh, of the construction estate as well. These are some of the examples uh, and some of the uses of the drones. Uh, with no doubt, uh, the drones, uh, you know, can uh, achieve area survey and the great mapping. Uh, and with the use of the drone, we can better understand the site condition surroundings. Uh, you know, and nowadays with the, uh, you know, heat and high temperatures, uh, sometimes it becomes too difficult for some individuals to go to the construction sites or the sites so they can uh, use drones and they can see images uh, from their offices with uh, just a click of a button and, uh, you know, transmission of those images from the drones uh, to their uh, desktops, they can view the construction size and we can monitor the construction size and we can do many, many operations. For example, on uh, construction size, we can with the use of the drones, those high tech drones, with laser technology, they can do lots of uh, measurements, uh, you know, uh, they can see uh, the progress in sites and they can give instructions uh, uh, and the like. So drones also uh, a great tool in supporting building evidence uh, on any construction contract. As I said, we'll be capturing of images on uh, either daily basis or weekly basis. Uh, these uh, are always recorded and analyzed and they can always be used as evidence in case of any dispute uh, emerge at the time of uh, the uh, construction stage. Now, there are certain uh, considerations that need uh, to be uh, looked at when it comes to uh, using drones. So other than using drones as a means of technology for better construction management, uh, we need to see uh, whether a drones are, uh, 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 the use of a drones uh, are uh, accredited and approved by our legal uh, system. Now, we understand there are some local laws and regulations for using it once, all right? But within the law, uh, within the legal system we have got, is it approved as mean of evidence to be used in case of uh, dispute? I mean, do the Qatari courts, for example, approve uh, evidences made by drones, okay? Uh, do they accept them as evidence to prove any point of view, for instance? Now, this requires a bit of investigation. And to be frank, I haven't looked uh, into this thoroughly, but I can say out of not recognized by the uh, uh, construction legal system within uh, other way it comes to classical uh, litigation. Obviously with arbitration and other means, of uh, ADRs, I believe, yes, they are acceptable. We are, who are into this business, would be willing to accept the uh, technology of drone uh, and evidence is produced by drones as, uh, you know, an approved and accredited evidence to support any uh, claim. Now, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are some contractual provisions need to be considered when it comes to uh, drafting out uh, the future construction uh, contracts. Now, as uh, I speak, uh, I must say within our condition of contracts, within our construction contract uh, with Ashgal, we use a drone to support the construction uh, activities. Okay, but uh, there are no provision within our uh, general condition of contract that drone or other means of technology use within uh, in our construction contract can be used as uh, evidence to support 
uh, any uh, uh, dispute. So we are currently working uh, on that and see how we can come up with a regime on how to uh, uh, use the drone and for what purpose and under what conditions. And also we have to look into the qualifications and vetting of uh, uh, you know, uh, for operators and the drone companies. Uh, it's not an easy uh, thing. Not everybody can fly and control drones. So it's very important uh, that we come up with certain uh, conditions uh, to permit the use of the drones uh, with the right people and the right company. And obviously, we had to come with the provisions on how to uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, work with the uh, analyzing the data, uh, capture data by using those uh, technology. We have to look into the insurance requirements, the cyber security, and the right software. And also, very important to come up with the safety and communication plan and the use of technology in supporting evidence in our construction uh, contract. So, again, uh, those data, somebody needs to, you know, obviously uh, process those data and who's going to be in charge of distributing and storing them. So this is something also we need to look at. They have to be very reliable and credible kind of uh, party to do that, whether it's contractor or, or the uh, client or a third party. This is something also we need to uh, uh, look at. Now, this is an important point I made post uh, project uh, Retention and archiving requirement. This is something very important. We need also to uh, decide uh, uh, on that. Now, one thing we have uh, introduced our operations the use of some mobile applications, and we have an application called Injaz. And this is an instant to produce reporting. We use also uh, imaging by using uh, drones, and this is frequently done, not on a daily basis. But those images are captured and transmitted to GSM uh, to uh, 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 you know, our uh, uh, receiving uh, equipment, such as uh, our uh, mobile phones, where uh, certain people have access to uh, these applications, can uh, uh, view uh, uh, the progress on any construction site. And if there are any abnormalities or anything can be seen, can be identified, and immediate response and information can be uh, uh, made. So obviously, proper decisions uh, can be taken after that. Now, thank you very much. I hope that I haven't uh, spent much time on this. And I'll be happy to answer any questions after uh, everyone completes uh, the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, so much for this uh, presentation. Um, I would like to present the second speaker, which is uh, Dr. Susan, Dr. Susan uh, Karamanian. Dr. Susan is the Dean of uh, um, College of Law in Hamad bin Khalifa University. Uh, Dr. Susan, uh, she held the leadership positions at the American University of Sharjah and George Washington University Law School. She is a member of the Executive Council of the American Society of International Law and was previously Vice President of ASIL. Uh, she was also the President of the Washington uh, Foreign Law Society. She has lectured in international law and in, uh, at the University of Paris, the uh, OAS Academy of International Law, Tamil uh, Nadu National Law School, the National Law School of India University, uh, Bangalore, and uh, the Hagio Academy of International Law. She has uh, presented two lectures as a part of the United Nations Audiovisual Library uh, of International Law. Uh, she is trustee of the Center of, for, the, uh, for American and International Law, uh, where she shares the Southwestern Institute and Comparative Law um, and the director of Texas, uh, at least. She is a member of the Council of, uh, on Foreign Relations, the American Council on uh, Germany, and the American Power Foundation. Well, actually, there was no enough space to mention the rest of the stuff. So, <laughs> uh, Doctor, uh, pleased that you are here with us. Uh, please, um, the floor is yours. I'm just going to stop my screen and welcome. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Saad, for that kind introduction. And it's an honor to be here with the ICC Young Arbitrators uh, Forum and to be with wonderful co-panelists. Um, I uh, enjoyed uh, hearing uh, 
Ahmed's remarks and focusing on collaborative partnering because uh, my remarks today are going to focus on on how we can um, integrate mediation into the arbitration process, in particular with a focus on uh, uh, possibilities and opportunities here in, 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 in Qatar. So I, I gather you can see my, my screen as my, I see some of my students are in the audience today. And um, yes. when we're in, in class, in the classroom, I prefer not to use a PowerPoint. Uh, but uh, in this medium, I do, and also because there are a couple of, of detailed arbitration clauses I want us to, to have an opportunity to look at in, in, in print. Um, now, I'm sure all of you are very familiar with um, the ADR, the Alternative Dispute Resolution, and particularly looking at uh, arbitration versus uh, mediation and arbitration being uh, mandatory dispute resolution under rules and before arbitrators selected by the parties. And so you get a complete resolution of your, your uh, uh, dispute. While mediation, and I use the definition here that is from the Singapore Convention, um, is a, a dispute resolution uh, under which the parties attempt to reach an amicable, amicable settlement uh, with the help of a third person or uh, persons, and that person or persons is known as the uh, uh, the mediators or the medi mediator in the singular. And um, I could just say as a point of, of personal reference, back in the 1980s when I started practicing law, arbitration was taking hold uh, but uh, in Texas, uh, the courts were very interested in mediation, and uh, we were quite skeptical as litigators uh, that a neutral person could bring parties together, particularly when you have commercial disputes in which a plaintiff may be seeking hundreds of millions of dollars and the defendant um, uh, believes that they have no liability whatsoever. Uh, yet uh, we started to have mandatory mediation. That is at some point the court would say, you need to have engaged a mediator and tried to settle this case. And, um, and I can say that that, that uh, development fundamentally changed uh, litigation. And so um, in Qatar, we have a lot of activity around arbitration. Um, we have the, the of, of course, the 2017 law, uh, which is largely based on the UNCTRAL Modern Arbitration Law. Uh, we had a recent development here in the Qatar International Court um, in which it has recognized that its, its first instant court is a competent court for arbitration, therefore expanding arbitration opportunities uh, uh, there. And of course, Qatar is a party um, to the New York Convention on the recognition and enforcement of, of foreign arbitral awards. Yet we've had some critical developments on the mediation front and, and Qatar uh, leading um, uh, an effort in terms of promoting uh, the Singapore Convention on, on, on Mediation, uh, having ratified uh, that convention. And within the Qatar International Court and Dispute Resolution Center, you're seeing an uptick in activity with regard to uh, mediation. Um, we have their mediation rules. We have a roster of mediators, which is absolutely critical. If we're gonna build mediation capacity here in the country, we need rules and we need people who are qualified to serve as mediators. And we also need uh, mediation uh, facilities. And so the interesting thing about arbitration and mediation is they share um, um, certain fundamental fundamental objectives, even though they're different. One is binding, um, in which the parties agree to have the arbitrator resolve the dispute. The other is one in which the parties agree to have a mediator try to, to, to get them to a settlement. Uh, but they, they share fundamental aims, uh, attempts to uh, ease the congestion in the court uh, to save uh, important resources, whether it be costs, and uh, time, uh, getting back uh, to, to this concept of collaboration, uh, a sense of can we have a dispute resolution process uh, that is um, one in which after uh, the matter is resolved that the parties at least are able to shake their hands, 
um, that they, they feel that they could perhaps go on with their relationship, that the process itself wasn't as stressful as, as, as what could happen at the courthouse. I think another critical issue is, is, is privacy. And this aspect of whether it be mediation or arbitration is not without controversy, as we've seen around the world. Um, uh, there could be a public interest in litigation and having matters resolved in courts. Um, and also the aim of having a full resolution, whether it be by the arbitrator that announces the award or the mediator that is able to bring the parties together and, and, and have them enter into a, uh, a binding agreement of, of, of settlement. And the process for both is based on, on, on consent, although the example I gave you earlier in Texas, we uh, consented to a mediator, but we were told by the court at by a certain date you needed to have engaged with that mediator and attempted to resolve your differences. So how can mediation and uh, arbitration uh, work in tandem? And the beauty of this is for us at this point right now with the country is we're still at a fairly you know, early stage and there are ways in which we can start thinking about having uh, blended uh, processes and, and like. And the first thing could be is that uh, you could have an arbitration clause that says that before the parties arbitrate, they should be required to try to settle their dispute through mediation. Okay, so you can see how mediation could be a condition to um, arbitrate or the parties could have an agreement to arbitrate and uh, before they in initiate the arbitration process, they say, let's think about a way of trying to settle this before we have to hire an arbitrator. Uh, instead, let's see if we could perhaps mediate our differences. Or perhaps even in the middle of the arbitration, they realize that they need help trying to get to a settlement. And perhaps they could engage a mediator uh, to do that. And then finally, and this is, I think, uh, another very interesting possibility, is even after we have an arbitration award, could is there still space for mediation? Because that award is a piece of paper, right? It has to get enforced in a court and there could be some uncertainty associated with that. Anytime there's probably this uncertainty, there is room for trying to get the parties uh, to settle. And so let me just identify certain issues associated with this integration uh, process. And then I would then like to just focus on, on uh, challenges for Qatar and then I'll uh, quickly conclude. And the first one really is about timing. Um, and uh, are we going to have mediation before uh, beginning um, arbitration or are we going to offer it in tandem with the arbitration? Now, the ICC has, and if you go to their website and I'm uh, I've got the link, um, the link there, uh, but you can uh, Google it and get this information as well. And a lot of uh, arbitration centers uh, have on their websites uh, clauses, our draft arbitration clauses, and we're starting to see mediation um, coming into uh, uh, some of these drafts. But if you look at the ICC clause uh, C, what we have here is uh, a clause that recognizes that if the parties have uh, uh, differences that they will first refer the dispute to proceedings under the ICC uh, mediation rules. So um, the ICC has arbitration rules and they also have uh, 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 mediation rules. Now the interesting aspect of this clause, the way it's drafted, is that the commencement of proceedings under the mediation rules, however, shall not prevent any party from convincing arbitration in accordance with sub, sub clause Y below. And then Y is here that recognizes uh, uh, the party's commitment to arbitrate under the ICC arbitration uh, rules. So this clause gives uh, parties, at least it, it may cause them to focus on mediation to say, hey, we, 
we should maybe think about mediation as opposed to just spending time uh, preparing, uh, you know, the request for arbitration and hiring an arbitrator, or sometimes, th you know, three arbitrators. Uh, let's focus on mediation first. Yet, the way the clause is drafted is it doesn't prevent arbitration from happening. Now, this could be sort of the worst of, of both worlds. Uh, you're spending money engaging a mediator, and then you find out you're spending money engaging an arbitrator. And the skills needed to mediate uh, and the, the type of approach you, you are uh, taking to mediate is a bit different than, than our arbitration. Um, and so uh, that's just something to, to, to think about just in terms of the timing. Are we going to um, require um, um, uh, mediation? Or if we suggest there is mediation, but we allow this arbitration, uh, what is, what is uh, the value in that? Another clause that perhaps will will give us a sense of, 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 of mediation as a condition uh, to arbitration is the ICC Clause uh, D, okay, which recognizes that if the parties have a dispute, that they shall first refer the dispute to proceedings under the mediation rules, okay? Yet there is connected with that a time limit. And so if the dispute hasn't been settled within 45 days, uh, after the filing of a request for mediation, then uh, the dispute shall be settled uh, by way of arbitration. So in this instance, what we have is a condition. And um, clearly, if you just rush to arbitrate without going through the mediation hurdle, you're, you, you may have certain challenges if, if a party wants to raise challenge, uh, a challenge uh, saying that a condition was not met to arbitrate. Um, and what this clause also does says it's not an open ending condition. There needs to be some clarity. Now they, they say 45 uh, days. Uh, sometimes mediation in very sophisticated cases could take, um, in one case I worked on, it took months on end to, to, to settle the case, but it was a, it was a very complex matter, um, a class action. And anytime the court ruled, the mediator would call because there was, um, at, at, at this point, there was some sense of vulnerability. Well, risk changed every time um, the, court, um, the court ruled. Um, another um, approach is to think of it as being uh, arbitration, uh, mediation, um, arbitration um, approach. So, so there are a couple of ways perhaps you, could, you can uh, uh, engage uh, the two concepts. And this is a clause from the Singapore Chamber of Maritime uh, uh, arbitration, and I'd like to to thank uh, Christopher Grout at the at the international court. He and I have been talking about uh, uh, mediation, and, and he said, "Take a look at this this clause," which then um, puts uh, first the concept of arbitration. That is, you're going to have a dispute, um, and it shall be referred to um, arbitration. Okay, uh, but. It also says that following the commencement of arbitration, they will attempt to resolve the dispute referred to in arbitration through mediation as well, okay? So, so there is built into the arbitration process um, uh, this concept of mediation. And then at the end, it says any settlement reached in the course of the mediation shall be referred to the arbitral tribunal appointed in accordance with the um, um, the, uh, uh, the Singapore Chamber rules and may be made a consent award on agreed terms. So that is taking an agreed upon settlement and then giving it the effect of an arbitral award, having it as some form of a consent um, um, award. Now, the fourth issue I'd like to just touch on after we've had a chance to look at these, these clauses, and, and, and I would encourage you, if you're interested in this subject, to, 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 to go to the, whether it be the, you know, Singapore or to uh, ICC, any of the major uh, um, dispute resolution centers and start looking at some of these clauses and thinking, thinking about how, how they uh, play out. It's just uh, the logistics. The fourth issue I would just say is, is the, the complexity, potential complexity of, of the integration process. You absolutely need to have carefully drafted uh, 
uh, uh, clauses for the examples I think I just gave you. The second thing that I would encourage is your mediator needs to be separate from the arbitrator uh, because mediators work in confidence. Well, the arbitrators do too, but they may hear things. They will hear things, whether it be from the lawyers or from the clients that they are not able to share with the other side. And if they're also the arbitrator, if they're wearing an arbitrator hat, there's no question that that information could potentially influence um, their, their decision if they're acting as an arbitrator. The third thing, the third logistical challenge is just on coordination. Um, and, and you may just say there's too much going on here. <laughs> Let's just go and see if we can mediate. Why do we need to go down the arbitration uh, uh, path? But the problem is, is if your mediation isn't successful, then you're either going to be in arbitration or at, at the courts. And so these clauses try to anticipate that. Uh, the fourth thing is uh, the importance of confidentiality. You're going to see that in bo uh, both uh, 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 processes, but maintaining that confidence when you go from um, the arbitration setting, for example, into mediation could be of a challenge. And then, of course, going back. And then the final thing is, is I think is a very interesting issue, and that is, is this um, uh, the, the authority of arbitrators to enter into these consent awards. Um, and it's interesting if you look at the Singapore Convention, uh, it carves out of, of a mediation um, settlement, so to speak, um, an arbitral award not subject to the uh, Singapore Convention. And so I think we're going to see some interesting developments in, in, in this area in particular. Now, um, Let's think about a couple of challenges for the country, because um, um, one of the, the first things, and, and, and I'm hoping that Dr. Ehab is going to touch on this, since I think he may have some, 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 some guidance on it, but is the need for a national uh, mediation um, law. We have uh, Qatar taking the lead at the international level with the Singapore Convention. It's only logical we're going to be seeing a national mediation uh, law. I think it'll be interesting if that law would touch on perhaps some of the issues related to, to mediation vis-a-vis -vis arbitration as opposed to just mediation vis-a-vis -vis the courts. The second thing is, and, and this is just based on my experience having uh, mediated many, many cases, is that the success of mediation depends on having trained and experienced mediators. And mediators, the skills they need is they need to bring parties together. And that may not be the same skill uh, that uh, the smartest lawyer in the room has, because the mediator needs to understand vulnerabilities and weaknesses, yet also strengths, and convey to the other side um, how uh, uh, perhaps there could be a vulnerability or a strength that could hurt or help their case. Um, I remember we would have um, in our mediation rules a process whereby we would select mediators. And one of the things I always urged was I want a mediator that the other side has confidence in. Why? Because if the other side believes that mediator, then that's a big hurdle um, to overcome. Because I felt like I could explain to, to my client uh, why we should be um, offering a settlement at a certain amount and the like. But it's really the job of the mediator to, to, to bring the parties um, uh, together. And then the final thing um, is I think that and that's why this is such an exciting time for the country is, is, is because we are, we're sort of on the cusp of some very big changes here. And particularly if we see things like a, a commercial court developing and the like, but is the acceptance of mediation and arbitration as part of the entirety of litigation, of the litigation um, uh, process. Um, and mediation in particular uh, as, as, as being a way that uh, becomes ingrained in, in, the culture, in the culture here. So uh, with that, um, I would just like to conclude uh, by um, saying that um, I think we're all here today because we want to make sure that we have 
a dispute resolution system that serves the interest of society. And that deals with uh, economic and time efficiency, and also systems that comport with fundamental uh, due process. And I think we should be thinking about how we can integrate mediation into arbitration so that Qatar can help uh, meet that goal. So thank you very much. And I look forward to um, the following presentation and then any questions uh, that arise. Thank you so much, doctor. Um, for this wonderful presentation as usual. So um, I'm gonna present the next speaker. Uh, who is uh, Dr. Ehab, Dr. Ehab al uh, He is a partner at uh, DLA Paper. Uh, Dr. Ehab focuses his practices in the area of uh, corporate law, uh, focusing on the Middle East, Gulf countries, and Qatar. He is a recognized leader uh, on in 2017 for legal uh, and arbitration and mediation practices. He holds a PhD from Queen Mary University of London and member of the Advisory Council of uh, Hamad bin Khalifa University, uh, College of Law, um, and also an executive committee of the European uh, Court of Arbitration, uh, Middle East Chapter, Italy. Um, he has served as a senior legal advisor for six years in Qatar Investment Authority and uh, senior legal advisor to the Amiri Diwan, um, uh, the office of the Amir uh, of Qatar of the Royal Court uh, for six years and previously Egyptian public uh, prosecutions and uh, jurisdictions for uh, more than 15 years uh, was his last position as uh, a judge in the Cairo course of appeal. He, he have drafted and uh, contributed to uh, several laws and uh, regulations of Qatar, GCC and Middle East. He have also uh, rights and lectures uh, at various universities and research institutes in, in Qatar, Egypt and other uh, countries. Uh, Dr. Ehab, uh, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Saad. I just want to make sure if you can uh, hear me well. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, thank you again for, for the invitation, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, I'm uh, honored to be with you. I had to turn off uh, my camera because I think my internet connection is not uh, very good, um, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely honored to be with such a distinguished panel of uh, speakers. Um, my, my, the point that I want to share with you uh, today um, are uh, what, what I can call practical points in relation to the developments of uh, uh, ADRs in Qatar. And I want always to look at these matters for you, uh, the audience being the young practitioners and so on, from a pragmatic and practical point of view. Uh, so let's let's set the uh, scene as, as it is now um, uh, from a legal and the regulatory point of view. We have, of course, the court system that we are all familiar with. Uh, just recently, the Council of Ministers approved establishing uh, financial or commercial courts uh, that will uh, look at specific disputes uh, with the target of uh, expediting resolving commercial and financial disputes. So that is for the side of the litigation. And then we have the arbitration. Uh, as you know very well, the legal and regulatory uh, framework for arbitration in Qatar is, I think, one of the best in uh, the region in terms of the arbitration law. Arbitration law of Qatar was issued in 2017. I had the honor to be the main rapporteur and drafter of that law. Uh, it is based completely on the unicentral model law with even further enhancements and uh, improvements. Um, so that is from uh, the, the existence of a state-of-the-art uh, piece of legislation. The two other most important components for a successful arbitration uh, world is 
number one, the institutional arbitration centers. And we have in Qatar, as we speak, from a legal point of view, the uh, Qatar International Center for Arbitration and Mediation. We have, of course, good efforts in Qatar International Court to have its own arbitration center and to have its own mediation center. Uh, this is something that we all look forward to have uh, in the very near future to add more to the resilience and to the comprehensiveness of the uh, dispute settlement mechanism in the state of Qatar. Uh, the third pillar of the successful arbitration uh, mechanism in a country is the practitioners. And of course, you guys in uh, the lead in, in, in this manner by uh, uh, like, uh, providing the uh, needs for successful arbitrations in terms of arbitrators, experts, lawyers, counselors, and so on and so forth. Um, what is the room for improvement for arbitration? I think we have to work very hard to support the uh, existing uh, arbitration center and to uh, 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 welcome very soon the arbitration center that should be established in the Qatar uh, International Court. Um, like this is what I wanted to say in relation to arbitration uh, uh, when we are uh, going through the entire system or entire mechanism of the dispute settlements in the state of approaches that we have seen the government taking board. Uh, in a very, uh, as you uh, look, I have. I think. Uh, I think the, uh, the connection is not. Sadly, I, have, I would call it this way. Doctor, I think the, the first one is not stable. Is so can the uh, compensation committee? I don't know how much do you know about it, but again, based on the fact that it's a. Uh, is this better? I, I stopped. I stopped your video, so I think uh, the connection is weak. So uh, uh, because the uh, the video will take more from the connection, so I made it stopped video. So maybe can voice or, or you, if you prefer to have the video back again, if your connection is stable, it's up to you. Doctor is still here. Uh, Doctor Hap, right. tell Doctor Hap comes back. Um, questions? We have questions. Can I ask the the uh, the uh, the, uh, the panel to join me? Ahmed, can you join us? I think the first question is important because it's for you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so one of the uh, the questions which which uh, which came here now. So what about the use of the BIM in alternative dispute resolution? Is it uh, a possibility? Um, and also, I think from the same um, um, person who was asking, he says specifically using the as built versus as bland no model uh, to visually show the evidence of the delay impact. And, and, uh, and I also can enhance this question by saying how these technologies can help, for example, avoiding the, the construction dispute, um, including um, uh, the BIM. Well, it's all to do with the right way of managing our information. Okay. Now, with the use of BIM, we would expect to achieve highest level of precision and having what has been designed physically implemented on the ground. Okay, now if there are no changes made, uh, then the, the chances to have a dispute is very minimal, uh, if not none. Okay, even with any changes made, 
things can be always rectified and corrected as we progress through, and that's going to be recorded. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So when it comes towards the end, when it comes to Asbel record, the Asbel uh, record uh, are basically a true reflection of what has been built physically on the construction site. Okay, so if there is anything different than what has been agreed upon at the issue for construction stage, for instance, okay, then that immediately can be identified and recognized as being an uh, additional work, for instance, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, going to constitute additional cost, additional time, it's going to be easy to be, uh, as I said, identified and dealt with, okay. But again, as I said earlier, we need to have the will of both parties working jointly on collaborative, uh, uh, you know, basis to uh, resolve those dis uh, disputes with a proper understanding. And it happens in our construction industry, unfortunately, and that is, is a, a, a default by culture. There are always these kind of resistance by trying to accept any claim for change for additional time or additional cost. Perfect. We had Dr. Ehab back. So uh, um, I think, uh, Dr. Ehab, I used to, uh, you came back yeah, last. I, I apologize again for no, the bad it's connection. Okay. It's fine. It's, it's, but it's, uh, it's, I don't know where, where, where did you lose me? I was uh, like having some general comments about the uh, different uh, uh, parts or different pillars that are holding the dispute settlement mechanism in, in Qatar. Uh, I, yeah. I talked about the existence of the court system and the newly uh, introduced commercial courts. Yes, we I heard all about, of this. I talked about the arbitration law and the importance of uh, encouraging and investing more in the, the only existing institutional arbitrations that we have in Qatar International Arbitration Center yeah. and the uh, uh, forthcoming arbitration center in Qatar International Court. Yeah. And uh, I mentioned that, uh, like, no, uh, uh, the state has done its, its, its own part by, pro by providing a very enabling and international standard piece of law. Now it is the role of the practitioners, the institutional arbitrator, arbitration centers, to work on uh, uh, building more resilience and more uh, uh, solid uh, arbitration mechanisms. Yes. And then I, I wanted to, to highlight, to be honest, three points that uh, the government has uh, uh, recently introduced. Bearing in mind, dear colleagues, that arbitration is not the target, as you know, or of course, even is not the target. It is justice, fairness, and the ease, ease of business. If we are able to achieve the ease of business and the dispute settlements for the practitioners, for the uh, uh, contracting uh, uh, companies, for construction companies, we will save a lot of uh, hassle and we will save a lot of uh, a reputational risk uh, uh, that we sometimes face here in the state of Qatar because of all uh, these spending matters. Therefore, the state uh, uh, introduced the idea of having a compensation committee the compensation committee is held under the Ministry of Finance and it receives complaints and uh, disputes that are raised by constructions or contracting companies against the governmental entities. Uh, uh, doctor, can you hear me? Uh, doctor. Okay, so tell the doctor come back. We stopped about the compensation committee. Um, so, uh, Doctor Susan, can I ask you a question? Actually, I have a few sure. questions for you, but let me sure. uh, start sure. with one of the my question. Actually, uh, how to encourage parties to involve or to use more the mediation? I know that you spoke about different aspects of the differences between the mediation and the arbitration, how to interpret both. But I would like to understand how to encourage the parties themselves to, to use the mediation as a tools of uh, ADR. Yeah, I think that's incumbent upon the lawyers, uh, for the lawyers to explain risk to their, to their clients and risk being a number of things, uncertainty at the courthouse, uh, but also costs. 
um, costs okay. going going forward and and the like and the need for finality and perhaps the need for the parties not to to be at, at an adversarial um, in adversarial positions um, it takes uh, it may take time and and and, and it is um, important to know that a case may not settle through mediation until certain facts are are developed or known or um, and so a good mediator really uh, understands this and and continues to to say well we didn't settle the case today but maybe we can have further conversations um, yeah. so so um, the you know what what was a what changed the the landscape in Texas was when the the court said you have to do this. You know, yeah. it's not that you're going to settle. Okay, you don't have to settle, but you at least have to go through this process. Yeah. And once we started going through the process, uh, we were able to. Um, it just became accepted, and in, in the scheduling order, it will say the parties must mediate by, and then the parties agree to a certain a certain um, a certain date. It's a very yeah. sophisticated process, and one of the questions I saw that came in um, and if 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 you have gets back on feel free to to cut me off uh, was uh, could an arbitrator be a mediator yes they could not I again I would not have an arbitrator uh, mediate the case in which they're also arbitrating I, I just think yeah. that that is um, um, a license for trouble but absolutely um, because first you want somebody who can deal with uh, legal issues who can deal with potentially complex um, complex matters and and yeah. and who can think of ways to bring parties to settle there are there's me uh, the question had a follow-up uh, to it is there mediation training and there is and and as I mentioned earlier effective mediators are not ones who come in and, and say Susan your client's case is weak you got to pay a hundred cents on the dollar that that that's not what mediators do what they do is they'll just say well you've got some problems with your case let me see if you know what I can do for the, the other side may not want to uh, 100 cents on the dollar, even if they have a strong case, because they're going to yeah. spend time um, waiting for a judgment in the courts for for years. I yeah, see Ehab yeah. is back. Okay, Ehab is here, so uh, we, we lost you at the uh, uh, the uh, committee of the Yeah. Okay, I think this is this is a very a very uh, like uh, encouraging approach from the government that it has put itself in, in the stake in, in, in the real uh, process in order to facilitate a kind of a very um, creative uh, mediation to settle the cases, to let the business run, to avoid, uh, as I said, reputational risk. This, this is a, a very, a very interesting initiative of arbitrations and disputes between the foreign contractors and the foreign construction companies uh, and the Qatari uh, governmental entities. We have two other uh, uh, mediation pieces of laws that were discussed on the level of the Council of Ministers and the level of the Shura Council. The first one is the uh, mediation attached to the court uh, system, which I think was similar to what Dr. Susan was explaining now, where the judge will refer the parties to uh, a sort of a mediation attached to the court system to settle specific uh, types of uh, the disputes. I think this is a good initiative. It has to be, of course, tested very well in order to avoid uh, uh, this new mechanism uh, um, uh, and to be uh, 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 like to add to the bureaucracy or to the lengthiness of the dispute uh, settlement. The third one that is relevant to uh, what Dr. Susan was mentioning after the uh, uh, signing and the ratification of the Singapore Convention was a perfect arbitration law, was a very progressive initiative in the government and in the arbitration centers. Uh, uh, now we are very near to have a mediation law issued. And that mediation law, uh, I had also the honor to work on, on the draft is exactly reflecting the unicetral uh, model law on uh, mediation with additional few clauses that is, are covering the costs of mediation and that are covering the enforcement of mediation. As you know, uh, like our mindset in the civil law countries, 
um, we are not yet uh, uh, there in relation to recognizing the enforceability of uh, a settlement agreement between the two parties. Therefore, we introduced here in this part of the law uh, a mechanism that is similar to the settlement uh, uh, notes that are presented in front of the civil courts according to the Qatari legal system, and the court will recognize them as a part of its uh, judicial decision. Um, I, I wanted to touch on uh, all uh, uh, these uh, matters to um, discuss with the young practitioners and to the attendees uh, all these matters and uh, to encourage everyone to look uh, uh, to the dispute settlement uh, mechanisms in Qatar in a macro point of view uh, and in a pragmatic uh, approach. Uh, we should not focus on a specific pillar without considering the rest of them. We need to work together to make sure that the commercial courts, the arbitration centers, the ad hoc arbitrations, the mediation that will be attached to the court system, the mediation, the commercial mediation that will be um, subject to the agreement of the parties as per uh, the unilateral model law. All these uh, approaches uh, as a compensation committee that the government is encouraging and sponsoring, as a matter of fact, and pushing for. All these elements should work together to uh, uh, um, uh, robust to uh, uh, um, uh, give further uh, energy and further uh, creativity to the dispute settlement mechanism in Qatar, especially that we are now one year and a half ahead to the World Cup. And as everyone knows, there are many entities and many projects uh, that will have a few claims here and disputes there and uh, uh, once they are uh, the projects are done and these matters are, are reopened uh, if we will have at that time a very uh, progressive and uh, uh, robust system for dispute settlement mechanism being the courts being the arbitration centers being the governmental committees being the mediation mechanism we will be in a very good shape in relation to the practice uh, of arbitration and mediation and the rest of the dispute settlement uh, uh, other alternatives that will be beneficial for the state, for the uh, uh, financial uh, activities and for us as uh, practitioners. I will uh, stop at this point. Thank everyone for being patient with me uh, during all of this kind of like, uh, connectivity and i'm very happy to uh, have to you okay thank you so much dr ahab so if you're still in, um, in in contact so maybe you can answer one of the questions um so a question says uh, can our arbitrators be dismissed by the mutual consist of both parties and if yes why this is a very large question as you know sad you are yeah, you are, you are, you are. You know that every every arbitration has its own uh, rules that is governing it. Yeah. Of course, uh, 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 it depends on uh, the terms of reference that the parties has agreed on, and in terms of is it an ad hoc arbitration or it, is it an institutional arbitration? Let's take the case that it is an institutional arbitration, uh, as as you know, according to Qatar International Arbitration Center rules. If yeah. a party is uh, refusing or objecting the choice of a specific arbitrator, uh, they uh, uh, can raise this and as other party can uh, suggest uh, other names. But if the parties will not be will not be in agreement on the names, the administration of the center will have to decide on that. Uh, but of course, like. All, all these matters are usually, uh, as, as everyone uh, is familiar with, are usually done in the early stages of forming the arbitral tribunal. Yep. Uh, uh, every party, uh, usually this is a standard case. Of course, there are cases that there is a single arbitration, for instance. So every party... Uh, doctor, before, I don't know if we lost you again or not, but uh, the next question will be to Ahmed. So can I ask the uh, the panel to join me? Uh, 
So, uh, Ahmed, uh, one of the questions, yeah. actually, which is actually even uh, interests me as a construction guy as well, uh, how this, the technology, which has been used or supposed to be used, or we would encourage people to use it on, on, uh, on the construction, help in, in reducing the cost of the dispute. Uh, this technology already came with, with a cost, right? Because it's not free. Using the BIM, it requires data entry and softwares and stuff like that. And even using the drones and all these issues, uh, it comes with a cost, of course. So how this cost will be able to reduce if it is reducing the cost of disputes in future? Well, if, if you go to uh, uh, the court, for example, here, and it happens in many years, instance courts, uh, you know, uh, use the service of experts, and those experts have to perform side visits, side surveys, look into things, look into yeah. evidences, all right? So with the uh, technology we have in place, with the evidence of activities on site, or whatever has been built, that helps very much in, uh, you know, uh, I'm not saying fully eliminating, but, uh, controlling the cost of site uh, investigations and site inspections by uh, experts, where evidences can be submitted in the form of documentation, reliable and credible documentation. So yeah. this is a major cost element associated with that, which can be dramatically reduced. Uh, and beside uh, that, uh, as I said earlier, our legal system uh, so far is not fully uh, recognizing, uh, you know, uh, evidence is generated by the latest technology we are currently using in our construction contracts. Yeah. But, uh, but it cannot uh, also uh, uh, refuse it, okay? They yeah. can still be, although there might be some difficulties in getting that through, because in one of the discussions I was part of just uh, last week, one of the experts said, no, there is, there is no way you can fully redundant site visits. They have to be done by, performed by, by experts, by whoever, you know, uh, yeah. side visits still needed. Yeah. Where, you know, so, so, so uh, we, we are currently working on that and convincing our legal system and judiciary system to accept the electronic technology as, as evidence, uh, you know, in supporting any cases. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ahmed. Uh, Dr. Susan, the next question is for you. I think uh, one of the gents is asking, uh, are there advantages in using a full-time ADR practitioners or are occasional practitioners more independent? Um, thank you for the question. I really think it depends on the nature of the case yeah. and the possible um, you know, ADR practitioners uh, who are available. Um, yeah. I, you know, implicit in, in the question is, is the, the need to have an indep independent, whether it be an arbitrator or a mediator. And it's incumbent upon uh, the parties when they're selecting um, yeah. an arbitrator or mediator to, to, to fully vet the candidate. Um, yeah. to determine whether there are conflicts and the like. And, and I know in, in, in my law firm, we had a substantial database of information and, and we could talk to, I could call my colleague and say, listen, I'm interested in mediating in front of, in front of this person. What was your experience? Okay. Now, the advantage of a full-time ADR practitioner is, um, and, 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 and again, I don't want to generalize, but many of them um, have had extensive uh, careers in litigation and, and, and she or he may at, at this point bring a lot of wisdom to, to a certain situation. Um, yeah. and bring a lot of experience. It, you know, it, it just depends. Um, yeah. but, but my experience was a lot of the full-time arbitrators, mediators were folks who after 30 or 40 years of practice had, had, had said, listen, why don't I take the knowledge that I've gained and try to, to bring folks um, um, yeah. uh, uh, together? But within, even within um, a law firm, you may find somebody who, who can get aside the conflicts and serve as an arbitrator or mediator, and that person may be as good as gold. Um, yeah, so yeah. it's hard. It's hard to generalize. Yeah. Uh, can yeah. I can I just pick up on this other question here? That's that that was about uh, if the contract contains a mediation clause and a litigation clause is compulsory. Yes, to, this yeah. was the next, next yeah. question. Yeah, can, can, it's a compulsory, can I read it yeah. for you first? You please do. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, uh, if the contract contains a mediation clause and litigation clause. Uh, is that compulsory to conduct a mediation period to litigation? Um, and it depends on the contract language. 
you could have um, the contract language. You may recall the first example I gave you from the ICC it sort of yeah. says, well, uh, you can mediate and and then, you know, you can stop your mediation at any time, but you're going to have to go arbitrate or it could be a condition or, yeah. or, or it can simply say nothing about mediation. You shall yeah. arbitrate. But then within the arbitration, the parties are free to step aside and see if they can go mediate. So uh, to the questioner, I would say, look at the at the arbitration mediation clause. What does it say? And that yeah. will uh, give you the guidance. Yeah. Uh, so I think this one, uh, one was uh, one of the last questions. We have some other questions, but uh, um, I think another one said, uh, for appointment of arbitrators may be subject to appeal within 15 days as far as the article 195, that this is time duration um, is applicable for all the cases in arbitration. So. I, I, that I inadvertently said I could answer that and I can't. That's a question for Dr. Ehoff. He, he would be able to answer, <laughs> yeah, answer that one. Yeah, I don't know why. Was, here. Yeah, he's back on time, you know? Yeah, oh, he's online. Good, there he, he is. He's back on time. So the question, doctor, let me just uh, put your name on the screen. So the question is um, for appointment of arbitrators may be subject to appeal within 15 days as far as the article uh, 195. At, at this time, duration is applicable for all the cases in arbitration. Uh, 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 article 195, 195, 195 of which, 195 of which yeah. law, guys? Uh, this uh, is, uh, well, which law, I think, so. I, I don't think that this is an applicable one anymore. Uh, for the information of everyone, as you know, uh, brothers, um, there was a section in relation to arbitration in the civil and commercial law yeah. of uh, Qatar. And with the issuance yeah. of the arbitration law in 2017, uh, this chapter is cancelled. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, yeah. the appointment and the removal of arbitrators is subject to only to the law. Okay. Yeah, probably he's saying law 2017. So yeah. 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 Perfect. Okay. So I think this is conclude the uh, the today mm -hmm. presentation, and uh, I wish if. Uh, the the attendees have more question they can even send it to us and we can forward to the speakers and uh, or if they can send it to the speaker uh, directly dr Habib, if you're still here would you show us your face for the last time so we can thank you uh, live if your connection will allow us uh Tilehab comes back or we can see him i would like to thank you so much dr susan for being with us uh, for your generosity and the wonderful presentation and enlightenment about the mediation and arbitration in qatar um ahmed i would like also to thank you so much for your time for the cooperation with the icc and the cir for the presentation you have done for uh, for us for uh, and giving us enlightenment for uh, the technology and the construction and how this could be reflected in disputes in, uh, in Qatar. Um, and hopefully when Dr. Rehab uh, coming back, we, he will see this from a video. So thank you so much, Dr. Rehab, and uh, for uh, for the localization of all the concepts who has been uh, um, said on this presentation. And thank you everyone for attending the, uh, the webinar. We will be uh, uploading that one on uh, our YouTube channel very soon. Thank you so much and have a good uh, day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. I'd like also, before I leave, to thank uh, our support team, Norul and Franco. Thank you so much, guys.